Hi everybody, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classics Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. Our mission is not to further vilify these individuals, but instead to challenge conventional wisdom and re-examine what has been accepted as fact. When Brett Favre was traded by Atlanta to Green Bay in 1992, could anyone have known what feats he would achieve? With just one season in the NFL, the third-string quarterback had done little to show the greatness that awaited. In this show, we'll count down the reasons why you can't blame the Falcons for dealing the future Hall of Famer. But first, let's take a look at why this trade has been judged as one of the most lopsided in NFL history. Number four, Brett Favre! The perfect throw by Brett Favre. One takes left, now rolls right, looks the end zone, throws the middle, touchdown! I think he is one of the top three or four all-time quarterbacks we've ever had. A roll to the right by Brett. Brett on his feet, fires the oh. door, no touchdown. Brett Favre's hook is, is there's no play he can't make. Brett Favre, you got to love him. I mean, he's oh, a football yeah. player. Brett Favre is a guy that's going to do everything he can to win a football game. To the end zone, touchdown! He's a guy that uh, doesn't back down. He'll stand in there and he takes his shots. Look at Brett Favre, throws a great Ooh. block. Brett Favre is one of the greatest players ever. So to trade him is inexcusable. Besides breaking 18 school records on the way to becoming Southern Mississippi's all-time leading passer, Brett Favre displayed a massive amount of true grit in his senior season. Two months earlier, he's in a car accident, and he had 30 inches of intestines removed, and then he goes out and he shows you he can lead Southern Miss to a victory over Alabama. Brett Favre comes through with a big play. I thought to myself, there's something in this player, boy, this guy's good. This guy can play coming off an injury like that. Selected by Atlanta as the 33rd overall pick in the 1991 draft and signed to a three-year, $1.5 million contract, Favre soon impressed his teammates and coaches with his primary weapon. He had the strongest arm I'd ever seen in a quarterback. He could literally throw the ball 100 yards. They're lining up with breath to throw the ball to see if he can hit the press box. He'd hit the TV stand. We'd just be like, God dang, I can't throw it that far. It was amazing. This ball might need to be surgically removed tomorrow. With Chris Miller starting, Favre saw almost no action in his first pro season, throwing just four passes. From the start, head coach Jerry Glanville and Ken Herock, vice president of player personnel, were at odds over the quarterback's potential. I said, okay, Brett Favre's up there. Does anybody here think that we shouldn't take him? And I hear the head coach say, you know, I like that Browning Nagel. We never said this before. I just stood up and said, listen, we're going to take Brett Favre. When I did that, I, I can see the coach about turn blue. Jerry Glanville almost never embraced players that Ken Herock uh, selected. You have a GM and a head coach that essentially loathe each other. It was more about the fact that Ken Herrock picked this quarterback. I didn't. And I think that's why Brett Favre was out of Atlanta in one year. The Packers dealt one of their two 1992 first-round draft picks to Atlanta today. That was in exchange for backup quarterback Brett Favre. On September 20th, 1992, Favre replaced injured starter Don Makowski in the third game of the year. With Favre at the helm, the Packers went 9-5. And, and four seasons later, Green Bay won its first Super Bowl in 29 years. The Vince Lombardi Trophy is coming home. That's where it started. That's going to throw it up over the middle. Three oh, touchdown. Wow. What a throw. We drafted him. He was here in Atlanta wearing a number four jersey. Our property could have done all that stuff for us. Green Bay played in back-to-back -back Super Bowls and didn't have a losing record over the next decade. Atlanta, meanwhile, suffered through eight losing seasons without Favre. We had more damn quarterbacks coming through the uh, Atlanta Falcons after Brett Favre left. Chris Miller, Billy Joe Tolliver, Jeff George, Bobby Bear. You always used to hear those whispers. Damn it, why did we let Brett go? You look back now, you go, what was Atlanta doing? How dumb was that? I don't know why anybody would be that, uh, I hate to say that, that's stupid. 
We have to blame the Falcons for trading Brett Favre. This guy's one of the greatest quarterbacks who's ever played the game, one of the greatest people, and one of the greatest characters. Well, you can clearly see why the Falcons appear to be guilty in the court of public opinion for trading one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. But before we tell you the top five reasons you can't blame Atlanta's brass, here are a few reasons that missed our list. We call them the best of the rest. Too legit to quit. The MC Hammer hit song was the theme of the Falcons' 1991 campaign when they went 10-6 and six and won their first playoff game in 13 years. The players won't quit. They're too legit to quit. We had excitement back in the town. We had a lot of talent uh, surrounding me and a good offensive line, good defense, a really talented uh, wide receiver core. Michael Hayes has just scored a touchdown. With Pro Bowl quarterback Chris Miller passing for 3,100 yards with 26 touchdowns, the Falcons look to trade Brett Favre. This guy's not playing anyway, and we can use that draft pick on maybe the final piece to get us over the hump. When you think you're one win away from getting a shot at maybe being a Super Bowl team, you can't blame the Falcons for taking a shot at it. Our other best of the rest, Tony Smith. Favre's teammate at Southern Mississippi was the first round pick the Falcons obtained as a result of the trade with the Packers. Tony Smith, touchdown, Golden Eagles. The fleet running back seemed like the real thing. Tony Smith could become an event in Atlanta, Tommy. You like him? Yeah, I like him a lot. He has great speed, runs very fluidly, very much like a Marcus Allen kind of guy. When we drafted him, we're all excited because he fits to the run and shoot as a receiver, a running back, return man. Well, that never came about. Tony didn't have a lot of courage, and he really wasn't a, that talented. Kind of one of those uh, look like Tarzan, play like Jane kind of guys who didn't like a whole lot of contact. Smith, he got in behind Kenton, but couldn't spring loose. Smith was a bust. After rushing for only 329 yards as a rookie, he never carried the ball again for Atlanta. Had he been the back that the Falcons thought he would be, uh, history might have been, uh, we might have been revisiting history at least a little bit. Reason number five, Brett Favre, he was a nobody. Atlanta has selected Brett Favre, quarterback, Southern Mississippi. Brett Favre was a nobody with a funny name. Was it Favre, was it uh, Favre? This was a guy that nobody had ever heard of. Drafted behind first round quarterbacks Dan McGuire and Todd Marinovich, Favre, selected in the second round, didn't win much support in Atlanta when he bragged on himself. I really believe that I am the best quarterback in this draft. We were watching film, and Chris Miller threw a pass. Brett made the comment loudly, I'll, I'll be starting by the third game. Right before the game, Brett would go up and tell Chris, Chris, go in there and mess it up, baby. I'll be in there by the fourth quarter. I'd always been a starter my whole life. Never sat on the bench. But that year in Atlanta, no one called my name. No one cared. You know, guys would pass right by me, you know, who was that guy? In February 1992, when the Falcons dealt far for the 17th pick of the upcoming draft, no tears were shed in Atlanta. Fans in Atlanta were more upset about a regular season loss to the Expos than they were about Brett Favre leaving town. The general public did not know nor care that Brett Favre had been traded. All they knew was that the Falcons had a number one draft pick coming their way. I don't think anybody on the team uh, felt like, man, we were, gonna, we we're missing out on the future. So they felt like, we get a first round pick for a second round guy who's not gonna play, who's a, who's a nobody, ship him out. Did that reason grab you? If not, we've got four more to go. Here's reason number four. Once again, it's Brett Favre. Considered a lost soul, he didn't fit in on a team with flamboyant personalities. Star power always lacked in Atlanta. And with too legit to quit, prime time and Jerry Glanville, finally Atlanta's on the map. Brett Favre didn't look like he was one of those superstars. I don't think Brett Favre cared about fitting into that culture. Brett Favre was casual, he was easy going. Favre failed to make a connection with his eccentric head coach, Jerry Glanville. He's riding a black Harley, wearing black leather coats, you know, wearing a cowboy hat, leaving tickets for James Dean and Elvis Presley. <laughs> A 
That's terrible running. The wheel's out on the slot. Get your ass up field. Jerry ran very tough training camps. Um, liked fighting, promoted fighting. Brett wasn't prepared for the NFL, and he certainly wasn't prepared for the way Jerry Glanville coached. Jerry Glanville didn't like the fact that he didn't have a very good work ethic. Glanville used to call him Mississippi in a sort of a derogatory way. Mississippi, you're not going to play tonight? I'll tell you what, we got to have two plane wrecks and four quarterbacks go down, and you're it. <laughs> Brett was a country guy who kind of had his own rules and his own disciplines, and that wasn't good enough for Jerry. You can't blame Jerry Glanville. You can't blame the Falcons. Once that season rolls around, it's what have you done for me lately? And you don't have time to babysit. Number three is again Brett Favre. He was a party boy. Even before his active nightlife became public knowledge in Green Bay, the quarterback prowled Atlanta after dark. He should have been on the cast of Animal House. He was the John Belushi kind of a character who just happened to be a football player. I could drink beer with the, with the best of them back then. and was about 250 pounds. I did more to hurt my cause than help it. A four-year starter at Southern Mississippi, Favre arrived in Atlanta weighing 217 pounds. When he wasn't allowed to play on the field, he played hard off it. He was a 248-pound, life-of-the-party, lampshade-wearing guy without any indication that he was going to grow up or mature. He was basically a guy that nobody thought was going to amount to anything. Even Brett Favre thought the same thing. I almost felt sorry for myself. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll be a big bum and drink beer and, and just whatever. Jerry Glanville was afraid that he was going to get a phone call at 3 a.m saying, you know what, Brett Favre just wrapped himself around a telephone pole. Favre's flaky behavior reached critical mass when he failed to show up for the Falcons' annual team photo session. He pulls in, he tells Jerry, he said, uh, yeah, coach, I was driving in and uh, I had a wreck. So I grabbed Favre and I said, how are you going to tell coach you had a wreck when your car's sitting right there? So he grabbed, coach, coach, come here. And he goes, Really, what I, had, I was in my buddy's car. He was bringing me up here, and then we had to wreck, and I had to go back and get my car. And Jerry asks, is that the story you're sticking to? And Brett looks at him, he puts his head down, and he goes, would you believe I saw a wreck? And Jerry just looked at him, and he said, you are a wreck. Soon after, head coach Jerry Glanville demoted Farr from second string to third string in favor of recently acquired Billy Joe Tolliver. Jerry Glanville didn't have the time to invest in a third string, out of shape, backup quarterback. You can't blame the Atlanta Falcons for thinking that maybe Brett Favre was gonna party his way out of the NFL. We hope you're beginning to question who's really to blame here. If not, here's reason number two. That's right, Brett Favre. He didn't even challenge for the job. He lost focus after starting out confident. We've got our starting quarterback here in Chris Miller, and, and hopefully he can do well for this team and we can win. Brett came in feeling very strongly that not only would he be the number two quarterback, but that in a very short period of time, he supplant Chris Miller as the starter. But the opportunity was a missed one, like many of his passes. He made throws in practice. You just went, where were you throwing that? He threw every pass end over end. And I can remember Brett coming off the field after virtually every practice that first week saying, damn, Len, I can't throw a Spyro. In two exhibition games, Favre didn't impress either. Favre dances, tries to handle him, and throws it up the Rams. We play him against the Rams in preseason, and he really stunk up the joint. Threw several interceptions. Ball wasn't on target. Throws into the end zone and almost intercepted. As we get out of training camp, our coaches aren't happy with our backup quarterback. So we need another one. Five days before the start of the regular season, the Falcons acquired Tolliver from San Diego. In essence, the Falcons said to Brett Favre, you're not only not good enough to challenge for the starting job, you're not good enough to be our number two. He was relegated to the third team and didn't fight back and didn't show him in practice. This is what I am. What he did show was an affinity for rest. He's asleep half the time I was throwing towels at him to wake his rear end up. 
He would fall asleep in the meetings, but uh, it was because he stayed up late the night before. I didn't see any reason why I should work hard in practice, and there's no reward for me. And I showed effort and all stuff. I still wouldn't have played, but they'd have said, well, you know, the guy's showing a little, you know, a little desire. I didn't show any. Farr finally got his chance in week 11, when the Falcons were losing 49 to 17 to the Redskins. He proved Glanville right. He's running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Farr still scrambling, finally sacked. There was nothing there to make you say, this is the guy that's going to make it all happen for us. Back to pass inside his own five. Throws it out over the top. Picked up. It's going to be Andre Cohen for a touchdown. Favre was sacked once and connected on two of four passes. The problem was both completions were to the other team. He probably wasn't too ready to go in or ready at that point in time for the, the system or the scheme or the plays. Quarterback's your leader. Not the guy that's going to fall asleep in a meeting, not know the plays. We can't even trust him with the scout team. So how are we going to trust him with our real team? Why change now? And who else? It's Brett Favre. He wanted a trade. He needed a trade. His future in Atlanta was behind him. He says, hey, I want to play. I can play. I can take you to the Super Bowl. If you guys aren't ever going to play me, go ahead and get rid of me. If I'm owning the team at the time, and I'm hearing that this, this screw-up of a quarterback is saying that I want to be traded, I'm going to trade him. You can't blame the Falcons for unloading a third-string quarterback that was overweight and partying too much and wanted no part of this city and going to get a first-round pick for him. The Falcons sent Favre to Green Bay, a city that rarely experienced the joys of winning since Vince Lombardi stepped down as coach after winning his second consecutive Super Bowl in 1968. When he came to Green Bay, Green Bay was beaten down. I mean, it was uh, 24 years. They had four winning seasons there. Oops, Mikowski slipped. What a horrible break for the Packers. People are being threatened. You better play better or I'm going to trade you to Green Bay. That's the way Green Bay was thought of. It was like the Siberia prison, you know, and nobody wanted to go there. I'm a Green Bay Packer now. You just got to be patient and uh, give me time because I promise I can be the man eventually. The calls came in from the fans. They were livid. Um, if the guy's riding the bench in Atlanta, what's he ever going to do in Green Bay? Where others saw misery, Favre saw possibility. I knew about the, the history and tradition, and I said, hey, this is a great opportunity for me. No player has ever come to a franchise in the NFL at a better time than Brett Favre came to the Green Bay Packers. They traded the first round pick for him, made him feel wanted. Given the opportunity, he might, he might be able to step in and have an opportunity to play. Favre got that chance in his third game with Green Bay. Mikowski now being carried off the field. I think that might be it for him today. And in comes uh, Brett Favre. He was running around for a long time, not knowing what to do. Fumbled the ball about eight or nine times, and it was making some dummy audibles that we didn't even have. Oh, they're in trouble here. Favre hits a photographer in the back of the end zone. The last drive of the game, he threw some great passes and obviously threw the winning touchdown pass. Now he's going to the end zone. There's a man. He's wide yeah, open. Touchdown. I can't believe it. Favre started the next game and didn't look back. His more than 200 consecutive starts is an NFL record for quarterbacks. Favre is on the run. Favre is down the sidelines. Favre, touchdown! A three-time MVP, he credits much of his success to the right coach and system. I fell into the right system. There's no doubt the ideal coach and mentor for me was here with Mike Holmgren. Are you all right? Yeah. No more rocket balls, please. As for the Falcons, the embarrassment grows each season Favre plays. But back in 1992, who would have known? At the time of the trade, I mean, it was the right thing to do. Unproven guy wasn't going to help us win a game in the next two or three years. When you have a Chris Miller, how can you keep a Brett Favre? Particularly when you've got a Brett Favre who everybody is looking at as this big screw-up. It made perfect sense to get rid of the guy. From the Falcon perspective, your quarterback just went to the Pro Bowl. Your team just went to the playoffs. I draft him in the second round. Green Bay's offering a first-round draft choice. 
why not do the deal? I don't hold it against them. I can see why they made the trade. No one knew, including myself, what was to come. Well, there you have it, the reasons why the Falcons can't be blamed for dealing Brett Favre after one disappointing season. We hope you've gained a new perspective on the Falcons trading away one of the game's best quarterbacks. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for joining us.